What counts as Jewish food? Can we define it in any strict way? When you ask American Jews to think of Jewish food, most of them think of Ashkenazi staples like kugel or bagels and lox, maybe eating a brisket on a holiday. The challenge with that kind of definition is that the foods aren't necessarily uniquely Jewish. The Jews are not the only people to boil dough and then bake it in, or to make bread in circles. That goes back to Roman times. And the word lox is also a word in German and in Swedish, which means salmon. They're also not necessarily that ancient. You know how Jews got started eating brisket? It was a cheap cut of meat that restaurants didn't want because it took too long to cook, to order. And so Jews were able to get it. And because it was so big, they had to eat it at holiday, at holiday time so it wouldn't go bad in the era of the literal ice box. And so it became a holiday tradition. Of course, there is the story of the Jewish family that always cut off the ends of the brisket but never quite knew why they did that. And so finally they asked their great grandmother, why is it that we always cut off the ends of the brisket? And she said, well, when we first started eating it, the pan was too short, so we just cut it off to fit. You know, sometimes we don't know where these traditions start. They might not have as deep a meaning as we might imagine. Or another example, we think of potato latkes as an old country traditional Jewish food for Hanukkah. But what did they eat in Eastern Europe before the potato? After all, there were Yiddish Jews before the potato made it from the Americas to Europe, let alone made it to Eastern Europe. They had to eat something. <laughs> they might've fried it in oil, but it probably wasn't a potato latke. The other challenge with defining Jewish food by our gut response, and the pun was intentional, um, is that they're not necessarily universally Jewish. That is, I'll give you an example from my father's family. My father and, uh, comes from a line of Syrian Jews. They're from Aleppo. Uh, which was in the news, unfortunately, over the last several years. Uh, but both his mother and his father were born there. He was born in Brooklyn, New York. But one of the traditional foods they would prepare on Shabbat in a Syrian Jewish household was a food called mujedra. Now, you may have seen mujedra. It's a lentil and rice dish uh, at a Middle Eastern restaurant. It's often eaten with caramelized onions and a special kind of yogurt called leban. It was a great food for Shabbat because you could eat it warm on Shabbat and then. You could eat it cold on Saturday morning or Saturday during the day, because of course, in an Orthodox household, you couldn't heat it up again. So you had to make a Shabbat dish that worked both warm and cold. Mujedra was the ticket. But if you asked an Ashkenazi Jew, do you like eating Mujedra for Shabbat? They would say, Mood, what? <laughs> they would have no idea what you were talking about. Now, there are some universal Jewish foods. Think about matzah. Right? Matzah is eaten in both Ashkenazi and Sephardi homes and Mizrahi homes and Maghrebi homes and all varieties of Jewish ethnic subgroups. But there's still some debate over the dietary rules on Passover. Matzah everyone agrees on. But Jews who lived in the Middle East were allowed to eat rice and beans during Passover, where Jews living in Eastern Europe and Central Europe in, uh, under Ashkenazi rules were not allowed to eat rice and beans. Everyone agreed you couldn't eat wheat, you, unless it was a matzah, you couldn't eat corn, but they disagreed about whether you could eat rice or beans, which led to the odd circumstance, and this is the case even today, as far as I know, that the Ashkenazi chief rabbi in Israel won't eat at the Sephardi chief rabbi's home on Passover because he's still having rice and beans in the Sephardi chief rabbi's menu. Well, as with food, and whether there's a universal Jewish food or not, so too with other parts of Jewish culture around the world. What language did Jewish historic communities speak? Well, they spoke many languages. There was Judeo-Greek and Judeo-Gese and Judeo-Arabic and Judeo-Spanish and Judeo-German, aka Yiddish. What did a traditional Jewish wedding dress look like? They could look radically different. If you ever go to the Israel Museum in Israel, uh, in Jerusalem, there's a fantastic exhibit of Jewish wedding dresses from all over the Jewish world. And you'll see how very different they are. They are not all Vera Wang in white. There's even an example of a creative tradition where they've saved the synagogue stone. The wedding traditionally in this German town would be held outside the synagogue, 
And at the end of the wedding, they did not step on the glass. They took the glass that they had drunk from and they smashed it on a special stone put in the synagogue corner for that purpose. Now, is that Jewish to break a glass? That Yes. <laughs> it just might not be what you're used to seeing. What does Jewish music sound like? Well, I hope you experienced a little bit during our Shabbat service that Jewish music can sound like very different kinds of music. There is no one sound of Jewish music. It doesn't even have to be in a minor key, as some might assume. And how do we celebrate Jewish holidays? Well, they come in all varieties. They don't always agree on which holidays to celebrate, as we'll see, and they don't always agree on how to celebrate them. I'll give you two examples for the holiday that just passed, which is the holiday of Purim. For Jews who live in Persia, what is today Iran, this is one of their most important holidays because it takes place where they're living, right? It takes place in the Persian empire. And so they go all out for this holiday. Two of the things they do uh, that are interesting, they actually hang Haman in effigy. You may remember at the end of the Purim story in the book of Esther, Haman and his 12 sons are hanged. They actually hang a Haman figure in effigy and sometimes even burn it. And the other thing they do that I find especially fun is they write the name of Haman on the bottom of their shoes. And then over the course of the whole day, they're walking around scuffing out Haman all day long. And they always said, wouldn't that be a fun tradition to bring into our Sunday schools? Teach the kids how to write hey, mem, and final nun, to write Haman on the bottom of their shoes with dry erase marker or chalk or something like that. And then they'll know all day long, whatever's left on the bottom of their shoe is scuffing out a little bit more of Haman. Now, I'm not Persian. None of the members of my congregation are of Persian Jewish background. But one of the questions we'll be exploring over the course of this weekend is if we are all cousins in this extended Jewish family, is it okay for us to borrow things that our Jewish cousins in Persia created that our Jewish cousins in Poland didn't? Or do we only stay in our lane and focus on our particular inheritance of Jewish tradition? Well, this weekend is focused on rediscovering Jewish diversity. And when humanistic Jewish congregations talk about diversity, we often focus on a diversity of ideologies and beliefs. You know, what's the variety of theological beliefs that fit under our general umbrella of what I call a positive humanism, a focus on what people can know and can't do instead of whether there is or is not a God and how much and what kind and all the details surrounding that. Or we might also argue over what's the range of political perspectives that can fit within a humanistic Jewish congregation. Well, we're trying to balance two values that are both important to us, individual freedom to make up a choice about our own life and how we live and whom we love with a sense of mutual responsibility as being part of a community and part of a society. And so in that range of balance of individual freedom and group responsibility, social responsibility, there may be a variety of political perspectives that can be compatible with a humanistic Jewish approach to life, just as there might be a variety of theological beliefs that might work within the umbrella of a humanistic Jewish congregation from atheist and agnostic to agnostic to deist to don't know, don't care, or even to someone who might believe in a God, but still emphasizes the power of human action and responsibility as we do as a congregation. After all, we have no inquisition. We might argue over what words we can say that reflect our beliefs and values and the beliefs and values that we share as a community. How do we feel both the continuity with Jewish tradition and the integrity of living out our humanistic lifestyle and beliefs? And how do we feel part of one community with many different minds? One of my congregation's attempts at creating a publicity slogan uh, was like-minded people who don't think alike. So we agree on the big questions, but we're allowed to disagree. And to be honest, as a rabbi, I have to say, I would be very uncomfortable in a group that agreed with me 100% of the time. That would get me nervous. But we don't talk about Jewish diversity within a community. And if we do talk about Jewish diversity within our communities, we often mean denominational diversity. What style of Judaism did you come from to land in a humanistic Jewish setting? Uh, some people, of course, were not raised Jewish at all. Maybe they chose to become Jewish or they found Jewish heritage and reconnected. Maybe they married someone Jewish and joined us. We have people in our communities who were raised secular Jews. They might have been raised in a humanistic Jewish congregation like myself. They might have been raised unaffiliated, not connected to any formal Jewish community. 
but a good chunk of our members were raised some variety of conservative or orthodox or reform or reconstructionist. And so our Jewish diversity conversation is on what melody you, do you use for this song or what ritual practices are you comfortable with? But they're not really talking about the kind of diversity we're going to be talking about this weekend. And if we do bring up the question of ethnic diversity, more often than not, we're talking about the diversity of people who have joined the Jewish family through marriage or through themselves becoming Jewish, the members of our communities who are from different religious or cultural heritage, or to put it in a pithy phrase, Jews and those who love them. We don't think as often about internal Jewish ethnic diversity, even though it's always been there. And that's why we call this weekend Rediscovering Jewish Diversity. Now, there are even some people out there who would argue that there is no one Jewish people or one Jewish culture. There are simply discrete Jewish ethnic groups that are separate from each other. You have Ashkenazi Jews, you have Sephardic Jews with roots in Spain, you have Mizrahi Jews from the Middle East, you have Mugrabi Jews from North Africa, you have Central Asian Jews like those from Azerbaijan, you have Ethiopian Jews. In more recent times, you have American Jews and Russian Jews who have their own particular experiences. Historically, the different communities looked very different. They spoke different languages. They ate different foods. They created different art. They even sometimes had different ritual practices. And by most measures of culture, that would add up to being very different cultures. And so to talk about Jewish culture and say, I'm a cultural Jew who connects to Jewish culture as if there's one might not make a lot of sense. Of course, I disagree with this because I am a cultural Jew. I do connect with all these varieties of Jewish culture. And when someone offers this critique to me, I give a very simple response. What counts as American food? We talked about Jewish food. What counts as American food? Well, hamburgers and hot dogs count as American food. Pizza, the way we eat it, is actually an American innovation. But Creole food in New Orleans is American food. Soul food in the South is American food. Tex-Mex food is American food. And ice cream cone is American food. Ice cream goes back a long time. The cone was invented actually at a baseball game when the ice cream seller ran out of cups and the waffle seller wasn't doing very well. To be honest, even our style of Chinese food is American food. Because if you go to China, it might taste very different, and I don't think they've ever heard of a general tso. When we claim to be part of the American people, it's not a uniformity. It's not one kind of person, at least those of us on the liberal end of the political spectrum think of Americanness that way, as a multi-hued melange of peoples and cultures and languages. It's American peoplehood is a claimed identity with some common features, some common holidays, some common rituals and routines, some common symbols, some common history that we even adopt. After all, we sing land where my fathers died, land of the pilgrim's pride, and immigrants can sing that. My fathers aren't buried here. My ancestors are buried in Aleppo. They're buried in Eastern Europe. But I can still claim the founding fathers as my claimed peoplehood heritage as part of the American people. And so the same can be true for a Jewish family to which people claim a connection, a kind of peoplehood. Um, as Rabbi Sivan Moss, who helps to run our movement in Israel, once said, it's unity without uniformity. We have a sense of connection, but we don't have to all be the same. All these Jewish cultures that we'll be exploring this weekend and ones even beyond the scope of what we'll be talking about over the next couple of days have many features in common. In every variety of Judaism that we know, there is some version of the Hebrew Bible. They may not always agree on all of which books belong in it, but there are certainly uh, some core books that are the same. Most of the holidays are in common among most of the Jewish communities, but there are some exceptions. The Beta Israel, the Ethiopian Jews will be talking about on Sunday, don't mark Purim the way that most Jews do. They have a fast day before for Esther, but don't have a celebration day. And uh, my understanding is they don't mark Hanukkah either. And the ultra-Orthodox Jews in the world don't mark Holocaust Memorial Day or Israeli Independence Day, because for them, those days are treif. They were established by the secular Knesset and not by a council of rabbis. So every Jewish community on some level has their own calendar of holidays that they observe. We make our own choices. 
we all have some connection to the Hebrew language in some way. It could be the alphabet that we've adapted to new languages. It could be words. It could be the original source text of our uh, core literature. There's some consistency across the life cycle and the marking of the arrival of children and the departure of the dead and everything in between. And even our ritual objects can find some similarities one to the other, though we may make different choices with them. After all, in many congregations, the Torah is kept in the ark. I have one in my office and at the Birmingham Temple, our founding congregation of humanistic Judaism, the Torah scroll is in the library with the other books. It's an important book, it's in a place of honor and you cannot check it out, but it is still in the library with the other books. So there are three challenges that we will be grappling with over the course of this weekend that I think this exploration of Jewish diversity will really open for us and I hope open, open fruitful conversations around as well. The first is, can we stretch ourselves to connect to foreign Jewish cultures, Jewish cultures we're not familiar with? Can we listen to the Abba Yudaya's version of Hine Matov and say, you know what, I like that version and I'm going to enjoy it and I'm going to learn to sing it too. Or do we always fall back on, well, that's not what I grew up with. And if it's not the way I've always done it, then I don't want to do it. And I often say in our congregations of all Jews that are out there, secular and humanistic Jews should not be the ones to say, well, this is the way we've always done it. The reality is that we've changed so much from Jewish tradition, we should be open to even changing our own traditions and understand that adopting these new to us, but not new to the world versions might be very meaningful and expressive of the diversity of the Jewish experience. So maybe we'll have to learn to stretch a bit to connect to these foreign Jewish cultures. We'll have, for example, tomorrow morning, uh, the opportunity to hear um, a in, uh, sorry, in the afternoon, in the early afternoon, an, an Arabic sounding version of a recitation of Hebrew prayers produced by one of these Mizrahi, these Eastern or Oriental Jewish communities. Uh, when you hear it, you'll think that doesn't sound like Hebrew, but it is Hebrew. And to them, it sounds like the right Hebrew. Um, and so this is part of our stretching process. The second question, are we allowed to use Jewish culture that is not our family tradition? One of the interesting challenges we grapple with today is the concept of cultural appropriation. If we take other people's cultures and monetize it and celebrate it and use it, sometimes mockingly, sometimes respectfully, but always complicated. And so do we get to claim as part of the Jewish family the right to use any variety of Jewish culture? Or does it require a little bit more measured approach, maybe some acknowledgement of original sources and artists and creativity? And the third question, are we allowed to create new Jewish cultural traditions? After all, every one of these communities we'll be exploring at one time made something new and different. They learned a new language. They moved to a new location. They created a new melody or wrote a new text. And they were willing to create new Jewish sources in the ancient, early medieval, late medieval, early modern, even in the modern, modern period. So are we free to do that in the postmodern world? To look back into our past, to find texts, ideas, melodies that inspire us and create anew? I think we are, but we'll find out more about how we are and how we can do that as we go through the weekend. And so I wanna end this formal presentation before I give you a review of what's going to be happening over the course of this program with an old Jewish story. In a particular Jewish community, they were having a major dispute at a particular moment in the Shabbat morning service. When it came time to recite a certain prayer, half of the congregation would stand up because they felt it was proper to be standing during this point in the service. And the other half of the congregation would stay seated because they felt it was traditional to stay seated at that point for the prayer recitation. And the part that stood up would yell at the ones who sat down to stand up and the ones who sat down would yell at the ones standing to sit down and the service would devolve into anarchy of yelling and acrimony. And so the leaders of the synagogue went to the oldest man in town to try to find out what was the, the real tradition, to stand or to sit. And so first the standers come to the man and say, grandfather, isn't it traditional at this point in the service to stand for the recitation of this prayer? And the man says, no, that's not the tradition. Aha, said this people who stay seated. It must mean that we stay seated during this point in the service. And the old man says, no, that's not the tradition either. 
Well, right now, half of us stand and half of us sit and everybody yells at each other. Ah, that's the tradition. There are no easy answers in Jewish life, and there's no one answer to what counts as tradition. And hopefully over the course of this weekend, we'll have a chance to explore some of the varieties of diverse Jewish traditions. So our program uh, begins tomorrow morning with our first session running from 9 to 11 a.m. Eastern, where we'll be exploring first, what are the Jews? If we're going to talk about a uh, Jewish cultural identity, a Jewish peoplehood, what does it mean to be Jewish? Is it a nationality or a religion or a race or a culture? How do we define those parameters so we can understand what we have in common with all these other Jewish communities? And then we'll look back over 2000 years to see what it was like for Jews living in Alexandria, Egypt at the height of the Hellenistic period. How did they balance their identity as Jews, but also as connected to the Hellenistic world and Greek philosophy? And what can that teach us about being Jewish in the 21st century, as well as what it means to be a secular and humanistic Jew in the 21st century? Because as we'll see, many of the questions that Hellenistic Jews were asking under the influence of philosophy 2000 years ago are the same kind of questions that we might be asking even today. Saturday afternoon, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern and going till 4 p.m., we look at two of these communities of the Eastern diaspora. Uh, that is Jews not living in Russia and Poland, but living in the Mediterranean basin, so to speak. We have the Jews of Baghdad and Iraq representing Mizrahi or Eastern Jews. And we have the Jews of Salonika in what is now Greece, but for many years was the Ottoman Empire. Um, and uh, their experience coming from Spain to Salonika also provides very interesting experiences of immigration and, as we'll find out, of majority Jewish experience, because for a long period of time, the Jews in Salonika were the largest ethnic group in a multi-ethnic setting. And what does that tell us both about Jewish assertions of power, but also the vicissitudes of history and the challenges of getting along in multi-ethnic settings? And then Sunday morning, as traditional like uh, Kahal Beira is free and open to anybody, we'll be exploring the Beta Israel, the Jewish community of Ethiopia, which is largely now in the state of Israel, um, and also working on connecting the dots. Uh, what all these examples of Judaism off the beaten path, if you use that phrase, uh, have in common, where do they diverge and what do they have in common? And most importantly, what can we learn from this as a way to open our Jewish communities to today's and tomorrow's Jewish diversity? And that's what I call connecting the dots. And if you can see what shape it makes, it's reflective of the goal for the weekend. And so at this point, I want to stop uh, the formal presentation and ask you if you have any uh, comments or questions or reactions to this exploration of uh, what it means to be Jewish and how we can explore diversity in a humanistic Jewish community. Of the Jews in Uganda, were they always Jews or did they convert? Well, it always depends on who you ask. <laughs> uh, many of these communities will claim a descent from one of the lost tribes of Israel or a descendant of King Solomon, as we'll see. Um, historians sometimes come up with different answers. I mean, this actually was a problem in other circles of human experience as well. Um, at one point, there was a, uh, a Native American tribe in the Pacific Northwest that had a claim to particular land. And um, they claimed that they got it because they had been there for the dawn of time. That's what their traditional wisdom said, as opposed to the Bering Strait story, you know, um, or when they might have actually migrated into the area according to archaeology. So the Jews of Uganda might claim an old pedigree. Most scholars think that they actually uh, converted to Judaism at some point in the 18th or 19th century. Um, and so they had some elements of their practice that reflect mainstream Jewish tradition and some elements that reflect a very different tradition. We'll see another example like that when we look at the Jews of Ethiopia, who have a very different biblical canon as one example. They have the same five books in the Torah, but their holy scripture is actually eight books long and in a bound book and not in a Torah scroll. Um, so different Jewish traditions have different backgrounds and they may have come from different places. We always have to balance their version of the story with what history suggests and you know, uh, judge with, uh, with mercy, we'll say. So um, we met Chinese Jews maybe 10 years ago um, at somebody's home. And I was wondering where were they then, would the day convert or were they there from some migration? Well, keep in mind that whoever you meet in person who identifies as Jewish may have had their own personal story. 
That is, there are a lot of people who are of every variety of color and shape and ethnic background in the world who now identify as Jewish. They could be the result of an intermarriage between someone born Jewish and someone not born Jewish who identifies as Jewish. They could be someone who converted on their own later in life. Um, there's an organization recently that hired the first Filipina woman to become a rabbi as one of their directors of diversity and outreach. Um, she converted as an adult. So if you meet someone who is Chinese and identifies as Jewish, they could be a later life addition, or they, were, they, they could claim China, descent. Though. They, they were could from China. Right. So there is an old Jewish community based in China that actually Marco Polo found when he went there and some of the um, uh, per Portuguese explorers that wound up in China found the Jewish community already there. Uh, what happened was there were a series of traders, it's T-R-A-D-E-R-S, not traders. Um, there were a series of traders who traveled all the way along the Silk Road. You may remember that Europe didn't learn how to make silk for a long time. And there was a special trading route called the Silk Road that ran from the Ottoman Empire all the way out to China through Central Asia. And Jewish merchants and traders who wanted to be part of this trade would travel along that route. And sometimes they would settle down at one point or another. And what often happened is they would marry local people because they didn't have women with them. They would marry a local woman. And in a patriarchal era, the woman would adopt the Jewish practice of the husband. Now, did they go through rabbinic conversion or did they simply adopt Jewish practice? We don't really know. Um, but the end result of that over many generations is people that to our eyes look Chinese, whatever that means, um, may have a direct line of Jewish descent going back to those traders uh, dating back to the early Middle Ages. Um, and so that's where the communities begin. Uh, one of the challenges is uh, how to maintain a difference. For a while, one of the ways you could tell the difference was the Jews in China didn't eat pork. They maintained that prohibition, even though that was a common staple food in the Chinese diet. Um, there were other ways they tried to mark distinctions, but it was tough to maintain uh, an identity in a community that actually is very welcome and opening to you. <laughs> because the more open they are, sometimes you get uh, sort of dissolved in the soup. If you think of it like a vegetable soup, the longer the carrot sits in the soup, the more it breaks down, the more the boundaries become softer and softer. It contributes something to the soup, but after a while, it might be hard to find that carrot. You drop a stone in a soup, it's not going to add a lot to the soup, but it's not going to dissolve either. Um, so that's sort of the balance of openness and closeness that Jewish communities have to strike. And the Chinese Jews are, are just one of many examples of that. You have Jews in India with a similar experience. And as we'll talk about tomorrow, one of the messages we want to get across this weekend, if you take nothing else, and I'll give you the preview tonight in case you don't come tomorrow, we should retire from our vocabulary the concept of looking Jewish, that so-and-so looks Jewish or so-and-so doesn't look Jewish. Because if you look at Jews in Yemen, they don't look like Jews from Poland. And they don't look like Jews from Syria. And they don't look like Jews from Morocco. And they don't look like Jews from Ethiopia. And they don't look like Jews from China or the Jews from India. There is no one way that Jews look. So we need to retire the concept of looking Jewish from our vocabulary. And hopefully this exploration of historical Jewish life will show us that. Because there never was one way to look Jewish. <laughs> um, and even more so now in a world of intermarriage and conversion and uh, openness uh, and, and fluid boundaries. It was always true, but it's even more true now than it was when it was true before. Oh, I was just going to say uh, on a trip to India, we were in southern India and we visited a synagogue that had been there since the 1500s. And the, it was really more of a museum. The community was probably down to 50 people. Um, but they still were making kipo. They were still making things um, in the little area. And it also reminded me of how we, you were talking about looking Jewish, and I was thinking about how we, the way we describe things, there are certain ways to describe something that is okay, and, so, and other times that is not. And there was a sign in the neighborhood that said, Jew town. Here we would never say that because Jew as an adjective sounds bad. You're not going to your Jew dentist. That sounds terrible. But it's not. It we. It's different. In other, no, um, nothing on you know that wasn't positive was meant by that. It was a neighborhood, and it was a historic neighborhood that had been there for hundreds of years, 
And so it was just interesting because I think when my kids first saw it, they thought, what? <laughs> what does it say? So it's it just, it was very interesting experience uh, to remember that not everybody does everything, you know, keep your expectations open, right? We can't assume what people mean necessarily. Yeah. And also, you know, be flexible to new experiences and new, uh, new approaches. I mean, that's one of the exciting things about the current era of Jewish life that we're in. If you want to find creative Jewish foods that are out there or creative Jewish traditions, you can find them. And you can find alternate ways to do Hanukkah and to do Passover, to do Purim. Uh, and people are really searching to uh, not only find them, but find a way to present them so that it's easy for people to adopt. Um, so doing the old family tradition can be wonderful, but doing the old family tradition plus a new family tradition that you found that's an old family tradition from another part of the family can be also interesting and exciting. Um, it can be, you know, more vegetarian appropriate, for example. Uh, Mujedra, for example, is a totally vegetarian dish. Uh, it doesn't require any meat, even though it's a traditional Shabbat dish, where most traditional Shabbat dishes have some kind of meat involved in them. Um, this is just one more example of how Jewish diversity opens up new opportunities for connection. Um, and as we'll see when we hear Ladino music, if you have people with Hispanic backgrounds or simply learning Spanish in school, Ladino is way easier to understand than Yiddish if you have some Spanish background. So there's all kinds of opportunities that are opened up by this exploration of Jewish diversity.